Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad to be with you, um, mainly because that means I made it through another week of camp with middle school students. Um, we had a great time uh, because it's summer. I hope you've had a great summer. Uh, mine has been full of, of lots of things, but lots of good things. Um, I, my wife and I took a trip to Paris. Uh, we actually ended up scheduling it on our anniversary. We had no idea we did that when we booked the tickets. Um, but we got to see Paris. We got to see some family that was over there, had a great time. We came back from that trip, and a couple weeks later, turned around and went back to my hometown in Texas, where we saw my little sister get married. Uh, and we provided a lot of labor for getting things set up and torn down and moved around. If you've ever helped throw a wedding, you know what I'm talking about. Um, we were beat whenever that week was over. And then directly after that week, I went and joined uh, our high school students up at a conference called CIY Move in Holland, Michigan, where we had a great trip. Uh, just lots of fun, lots of laughter, and lots of seeing God work in our high school students. And this last week, I was actually away with our middle school students at an event called CIY Mix, where we had an absolutely fantastic time. Lots of great things happening with our students. And it's not just limited to our students as well. Uh, our elementary students and our E91 kids team just racked up a week of camp at Camp Allendale. Um, so if you want to talk about real world faith, let's talk about giving up a week of your life to spend it with high school students, middle school students, or elementary students. Okay, These guys are heroes. They're absolutely rock stars. So thank you if you're one of those people. Uh, I'm excited because we get to talk about real world faith today, but whenever I think about summer and whenever I think about trips or traveling, I think about my friend JD. Uh, JD and I worked at the same church whenever we both immediately graduated college out in the Baltimore area. Uh, we were kind of going through a lot of the same things. We'd moved away from our families, we'd moved away from our friends. We were trying to figure out how do we do life on our own? We also had some kind of personal things. We'd gone through some, some similar stuff in our past, and our families were, were fairly similar as well. We both had uh, brothers or sisters that were much younger than us. Uh, he had a younger brother named Cody, uh, who that summer was going into eighth grade. And it was uh, one of those weeks in summer where there was nothing really going on, and so mom back home in Wisconsin said, hey, I'm going to fly your younger brother out to see you. You guys spend like a week together. And they were really excited about it. They had a really good relationship, even though there was a lot of years in between them. You know, there was the conversation between all three of them, like, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to get Cody to the plane. You're going to pick Cody up at the airport. Cody, you understand, don't go with any strangers, right? We have to have the stranger danger conversation. So everything happens. JD's really excited about it, the, the week that it's going to happen. Finally, on Wednesday, JD comes into the office like, man, I cannot wait for my brother to get here. We are going to have so much fun this week. The end of the day comes, JD jumps in his car. He's got a real small red hatchback that he drove around at the time. Uh, and he's like, I've got to go pick up my brother. It was about a 30, 45-minute drive, depending on traffic or depending on how fast you drive, let's be honest. And so he gets down, Baltimore's a pretty good-sized airport, and they've got a pretty significant cell phone lot that sits aside from it. He's waiting for his brother. The time hits, waits a little bit longer. His brother calls, says, hey, I've got my bags. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. JD turns on his car. He starts doing the thing that we all do when you go to the airport to pick someone up as soon as you get in the airport loop, right? You immediately drive super slow looking for someone or something that you recognize. Like, that's the person that I'm looking for. And if you're standing on the, on the curbside of the airport, you're kind of doing that thing where you're looking like, is that the car? Is that the, which, which car are they in? I don't understand. I'm, what car am I looking for today? And so he does the thing where he drives the whole loop, and he doesn't see Cody. He goes, okay. Cody, where are you? I'm outside of the airport. I'm waiting for you. Okay, I'm going to drive through again. I'm going to try and figure it out. And he drives through even slower through the airport. Now, you need to understand this about Baltimore drivers. They are always late. doesn't matter. They needed to be wherever they were going 15 minutes ago. And driving slowly through the airport is not helping anyone. So he's causing this massive tra traffic jam behind him. He's looking for his brother. He does this second pass through, and he can't find Cody. So he goes back to the cell phone lot, and he pulls out his phone and says, Cody, where are you? I'm outside the airport. I'm on the curb. I'm waiting for you. I'm seeing tons of cars. Cody, are you at the right airport? <laughs> yes, I'm at the right airport. It says BWI. It's Baltimore, right? Okay. JD, are you at the right airport? Yes, I'm at the right airport. I know what I'm doing. It takes 30 minutes of conversation. It says, Cody, whenever you got your stuff, whenever you got off the plane, got your stuff, what did you do? I went downstairs. I got my stuff. I grabbed it. I looked up. I saw a sign that said arrivals. I saw a sign that said departures. I'm ready to leave. So I went to departures. <laughs> Cody, come on, man. Come on. Little brother was upstairs. JD's downstairs trying to drive through. They are so close to one another. 
but they ended up missing each other for a long, long time. Sometimes it feels like that happens to me. Sometimes it feels like I am so close to the thing that I want. I am so close to the thing that I'm trying to get, but still I'm some, so, somehow so far away. I still miss it. If you're a high school student or a middle school student, maybe this past year you made a deal with your parents. You said, I'm going to have an 85 average in all of my classes at the end of this year. So you've worked hard. The the report cards came out at Christmas. You're like, okay, I'm doing all right, but I've got to pull that math grade up just a little bit right here. The spring break comes, and you look at the report card, and you go, all right, I've got to pull my grade up just a little bit more. And then that final check comes through, and you realize that in the grade book you have an 84.4. You're like, come on. You go to the teacher. You beg. Can you just round it up a little bit? Nope. (laughs) Sometimes we're so close, but we're so far away. Uh, Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you feel like, you know what? I'm going to clean this whole house. By the time my spouse comes home from work today, this place will be clean. And you start off and you've got all the energy in the world. You've got the playlist playing through the house. You're ready to go. You're making a giant mess as you pull out all the cleaning supplies. But that doesn't matter because you're cleaning. And so you're going to get to it eventually. And it finally comes, you look down, and you're like, I am beat. I am worn out. It's 4.30. It's 5.30. Whenever your spouse or your partner comes home, and you walk through the house one last time, and you turn the corner, and for me, it's usually the bathroom. Oh, no. I forgot the bathroom. Or maybe you forget the kitchen. You're letting there's just dishes everywhere, and you hear the garage door go up at that moment. You were so close. But it doesn't matter. You still missed it. Maybe you've been chasing a certain sales goal. Maybe you've been chasing a certain quota at work. And you say, listen, I'm just going to put my head down for a little bit right here. I'm going to push through, and I'm going to get it, and then we're just going to be able to sit for a little bit. And maybe you actually accomplished it. Maybe you got to that spot. You're like, I hit the number that I wanted to hit. This is great news. But then all of a sudden, your supervisor comes to you and says, hey, we really love what you did this last month. Um, can you do that every month? And you go, I, I thought I was just pushing for a little bit, but now this is the, the standard, and this is not the goal that I wanted. This is not what I thought I was chasing after. Whenever we go on a trip with our students, whether it's see how I move or mix, or we do a weekend trip just with our students, um, we kind of ask them, hey, why do you think you're here? Some of them, the number one answer that we hear from our students is, man, I just wanted to spend time with my friends. Man, that's awesome. Sometimes we get the answer from students, hey, I didn't know I was coming until mom said pack a bag, um, and she just dropped me off. But if we drill down a little bit, sometimes we find the answer where a student says, listen, I want to be closer to God. I just want to be closer to God in everything that I do. This is something that we feel like. So what we end up doing in our own lives, whenever we feel this problem, whenever we feel this tension, I want to be closer to God. What we end up doing is we end up filling our calendars. We end up filling our schedules. We put reminder after reminder in our phone. Say, all right, I'm going to overload myself so that at the end, I will be closer to God. I'm in 15 Bible studies. I'm in five small groups. I don't sleep, but I'm closer to God at the end of it. Sometimes we just end up setting ourselves up for failure. A couple years ago, there was a guy, his name is John Acuff. Uh, He wrote a book called Finish. John is a guy who loves Jesus. This is not a book about following or loving Jesus. It's about reaching and setting goals that you can actually accomplish. And he partnered up with a PhD student who was doing some research And they would do all these different interviews, and they would say, all right, hey, what's the goal that you're trying to do in your life? And they'd hear goals from from all over the place. But especially what they noticed, somebody would say, hey, I want to run a 5K. I want to run a half marathon. I want to run a marathon. They'd sit down and say, oh, okay, cool. So that involves lots of training. That involves lots of running. Um, Do you like running? And almost to the person, they would say, no, I hate it. It's got to be good for me, though. It's like when you're a kid and you're trying to eat vegetables. It doesn't taste good, so it must be healthy for me, right? What they found with these people who were trying to force themselves to run some kind of race, to reach some kind of goal, is that because they thought it was going to be good for them, they would train and they would push and they would work hard and they might actually accomplish the goal. They'd be able to run the race. They'd finish it. But then because they hated it so much, what they would end up doing is they'd just stop all activity. And whenever they looked at themselves, they were like, man, I used to be really good and in shape, but now I'm further away from where I was when I started running this race. Sometimes that happens to us. We say, I want to be closer to God, so I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to work really hard. I'm just going to force myself to be closer to God. And we get burnt out. And then what happens is we start sliding further and further away from God. So how do we solve this problem? 
How do we actually get closer to God without burning ourselves out? How do we get to the spot where we say, I'm closer to God and I feel good about what I'm doing because I'm not burnt out how I've done it? Today what we're going to do is we're going to try and solve that question. We're going to try and solve that tension um, by looking at what James has to say in James chapter 4. If you've got a Bible or a Bible app, I want to encourage you to go ahead and turn there. We're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 4. Um, but as you're turning there, just a quick reminder. Whenever James sits down and he writes his letter in the first century, James does not write to a specific city or a specific church or a specific location. What James does is he says this letter is to all the believers who are scattered across the earth. And James knows that anything he puts in his letter has to be applicable to everyone spread across the earth. And I think James actually does that and more because what we're reading today is still applicable to us in our lives in 2019. All right, so if you're there in James chapter 4, I want to remind you really quickly, if you look back or you flip back, James chapter 3 where Dave ended us last week, um, Dave said, here's the deal, wisdom brings peace but peace leads to righteousness. This is important because not only is it what James said, but this kind of sets up what James says in chapter four leading into it. So again, wisdom brings peace, peace leads to righteousness. Now this is again is important because as soon as we start in with chapter four, James comes out swinging, all right? Buckle up, I'm warning you right now before we get started right here. All right, let's look at it. James chapter four, verse one. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think, Scripture says without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Guys, <laughs> James has said, listen, the reason that we fight, the reason that we quarrel is because we don't have wisdom, because we don't have peace, because we don't have a good relationship with God. This is what's causing all of our problems. This is what's causing us to fight with one another. James says, more importantly, because we don't have these things, wisdom, peace, and righteousness that causes us to be in a fight with God. And we cannot draw close to a God that we are fighting with. We cannot cause ourselves to be closer through any action, through any Bible study, through any prayer group, through any reminder that we set in our phone if we are still at war with God. Luckily for us, though, James continues, and James doesn't stop there. He says, here's how we're going to solve this problem. Here's how we're going to solve this space between us and God. He says this, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify you hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. That might be my favorite verse out of the whole thing right there because that is no one's life verse. That is on no pillow, no coffee cup right there, right? Here, I bombed this for you. It says grieve, mourn, and wail. Nope. <laughs> James says this, change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. James says, here's the deal. If you want to stop this, if you want to end this fight with your, your fellow believers, if you want to end this fight with God, you need to draw close to God. So what does that look like? And James does something interesting whenever he's, he goes through this passage right here. Um, whenever he says, come near to God and God will come near to you. He's using a word, he's using a phrase that people who were familiar with Jesus would have heard before. Whenever Jesus was 
alive and he was teaching and preaching through Israel, often Jesus would walk through and he would perform a miracle. He'd heal somebody of a sickness. He'd raise somebody from the dead. He'd give a, a, an incredible teaching to a crowd. And then he'd say, listen, the kingdom of God is near. He'd say that several times. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is coming but there's no way for you and I, for anyone who is listening to Jesus, to say, how do I get closer to the kingdom of God? It's here. I can't move physically closer one step in any direction and be closer to the kingdom of God. What Jesus is saying and what James is saying is, listen, we can't physically get closer to it through any action. But what we can do is we can change our heart and we can change our attitudes to be more in line with the kingdom of God, to be closer to God, and to feel like I am in step and no longer fighting with God. This is what it comes down to. I think if we could take this all and we could shrink it down into one sentence, I think it would look something like this. I think it would say, real world faith is more about your attitudes than your actions. I wanna be really honest. This is a really easy sentence to write or to type and to put up on screen and say in front of all of you, what gets really hard is whenever I flip it around and I make it personal. Whenever I say real world faith is more about my actions or my attitudes than my actions, all of a sudden it goes, oh, now I have to change. And we have to deal with this. This is hard. James continues a little bit here with verse 11. Here's what he has to say. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. So after all this, James has given us, he says, all right, this is how you draw near to God. You stop quarreling, you stop fighting, and you get closer to God. But what does that look like? What does it mean? How do we get closer to God? If I can't physically take a step in any direction and be closer to God, how do I accomplish it? How do we group ourselves? Who's close to God? Who's not? I owe this next little bit uh, to a friend named Nathan. Nathan taught me this probably four or five years ago, uh, and it has stuck with me ever since. And it's a, it's a way that we kind of classify things or classify people um, in, in really any field. The first kind of way that we would classify something is what's called a bounded set, and it looks like this. Okay, In a bounded set, you see right here, there's the center dot, and there's an outside circle right here. Now, in a bounded set, what this means is anything or anyone who is inside this circle right here is in. They are good to go. Anybody outside right here is, doesn't matter, doesn't count. They are not on the in. So somebody can be sitting all the way right here, the last pixel before you hit that black, that black line right there, they're still considered in. They're still considered good. If somebody could come from all the way over here and they could end up right next to that line, but they'd still be considered out. For us, sometimes how we describe this is the people who are inside a circle like this are the good Christians or the growing Christians. People who are in Bible studies, people who are in small groups, people who are doing all of the things that we think we should sometimes. But sometimes if you can't get across this line right here, if you're just on the outside and you, for whatever reason, your schedule doesn't allow it or you've got something else going on, then you're not good enough. You are not inside the set. And it doesn't matter what you do. You cannot force yourself across that line. And that is defeating. That is, that is hard to hear. That is hard to work with. But I think there's another way of looking at things. I think there's another way that we can solve this issue, that we can try and figure this out. And that's called our next slide. That is a centered set. You can see right here, there's some similarities. There is still a centered dot, but the outside ring is gone. And in a centered set, when you're trying to count, when you're trying to figure out what's important, all that matters is, are you moving towards the center right here? So it doesn't matter if you can't make time for the 15th Bible study. There is nothing wrong with Bible studies. Please hear me in that. But if you're overloading your schedule to the point where you're saying, I'm going to do all of this and I'm going to be closer to God, you might force yourself a little bit closer, but in the end, you're going to get burnt out and you're going to end up falling away from the center. And here's the more important thing. The thing that's at the center right here is not a set of actions. 
It's not a set of things that you can do. The thing that's at the center of a centered set for us is Jesus. All that matters is are you moving closer to Jesus? If real world faith is more about our attitude than about our actions, then there is nothing that we can do if we're in a set and we are just moving right towards Jesus. If we are moving closer to Jesus, that's all that matters right there. This is so important to what we believe here at E91. This is at the very center of what we're trying to do. Matter of fact, we've put it on almost every piece of paper and every email that gets sent out of here. Because we believe at the core of our mission and who we are supposed to be that we are supposed to be helping people take next steps with Jesus. That's our mission. That's our thing right there. That is what we are called to do. We hope that whenever you walk out of here today, you feel like you have moved closer to Jesus. We hope that whenever you go to work tomorrow, that you feel like you are closer to Jesus and that you can continue to take a step closer to Jesus no matter what life throws at you. We've got to figure out where is God calling us? Where, what is the center that Jesus is pulling us towards? And if that's Jesus, keep following that. Keep taking a step towards it. Because that's what real world faith looks like. You may be similar to me. Um, whenever I was younger, um, and honestly, until about a year ago, I felt like every problem in my life could be solved by two things. Putting my head down and running harder. For a lot of my life, that worked really well. Some of you know I grew up in Texas. I played football. I was a wrestler. Those are two really good things if you're good at putting your head down and running harder. You know, and even when it came to academics, you know, I can spend 30 more minutes on a project or studying for a test. I can be ready. I can get that grade up. Go to college. All right, I've got to balance all these new relationships. I've got to balance a job. I've got to balance these school things. I've got to balance serving opportunities. All right, I'm just going to put my head down and I'm going to run a little bit harder graduated college, moved to, to Maryland, got a job working in church. How do I balance my time and how do I balance what I'm supposed to be doing in the church? All right, I'm just going to put my head down. I'm going to run a little bit harder. Then I got married and figured out, all right, I'm just going to put my head down and I'm going to run a little bit harder and we're just going to get to the other side of this. About four years ago, I ran out of push. <laughs> I put my head down. I said, I'm going to run harder. I'm going to push harder. I'm going to try and do more just to make it through. And I ran out. I, I had to take some time. I had to, to recalibrate my heart. I had to recalibrate my soul. I had to say, all right, what's really important? What is Jesus calling me to do? What is that next step that I need to take with him? And it is so much better on the other side. I hope that this week you have a moment to just recalibrate your heart, to recalibrate your soul. And just say, what do I really need to be focusing on? Where do I need to take my next step with Jesus? Because when we do, that's a kind of real world faith that the world notices. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to gather together, to sing, to meet friends, and to open your word. God, I ask this morning, that you would show every one of us if there's something we need to stop doing or if there's something we need to start doing to just take a step closer to you. God, will you show us how to end the fights with one another, how to end the fights with you and to be back where you call us to be. It's in your name that we pray.